Genesis chapter 39, God's word this morning, an errant, inspired, and fallible, a little bit of a longer passage this morning, but, but important that we, uh, that, that we read all of it here. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelite, who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in the house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was in all that he had, in house and in field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and after a time his master's wife cast eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he's put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she, she called the men of her household and said, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as, she heard, as, soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice, he cried out. He left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid his garment by her until her master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard these words that his wife spoke to him, This is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Okay, let's, uh, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word that it speaks to every part of our life, that God, we can rely on it and we can trust it. So Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring this word alive to us today, that our eyes would be open, that our hearts and our minds would be teachable and moldable and that, God, only the way that you can do it, as we digest this today, we would leave here and we would live like what we've read and studied truly matters. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, I, I wonder if, um, if, if, if the, the chains were, were heavy. I've wondered this week if the, the shackles around Joseph's wrist were, were tight. I, I've wondered what the collar around his neck must have felt like. I mean, surely if he was a prisoner, slave to be sold in transit, he would have had a collar around his neck. Perhaps, perhaps he walked in a line with with other men, women, and young people who were off to be sold as slaves in Egypt. I wonder if Joseph, as he departed his brothers in that area that we call Dothan, and were walking in a chain caravan towards Egypt, if his body was sore from the, the beatdown that his brothers just gave him, the thud that happened when he was dropped to the bottom of the pit, I I, I mean, I wonder, I wonder how long, just thinking about this this week, like, like, like how long did the tears of hurt and betrayal from his brothers flow down his sand-covered and, and, and bloody cheeks as he headed off to Egypt? I, I wonder about like, like, like the, the emotional trauma that was going through his mind. I, 
I wonder if as he walked, if he kept replaying the events that had just happened, to go from the father's favorite son to just sent on an errand to check on the big brothers. How's it going down there? How, how's the shepherding going? And the sudden betrayal. The, the murder plot turned profitable to send him as a slave to Egypt. How, how many times has he walked covered with chains? Did he recount this in his mind? I mean, we read these words and and, and the challenge sometimes when we look at the scripture is some of these stories that we, we call them, we, you know, we've known them for so long, we, we just kind of read through them. We forget to actually think about what was it actually like? What, what did that moment feel like? When, when you've been taught that, that you know, the, the God of your fathers, the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, that he's a good God and, and there's a good plan and and your life is insulated and everything is good. And then here's 17-year-old Joseph off to slavery. Life is like that sometimes. It can change fast. And we can suddenly find ourselves in very uncertain places and in very uncertain times. I was reminded kind of as I studied this week of something I read a long time ago and I, I had to kind of hunt it down a little bit of of a young man named, he was 19 years old, um, Jan, spelled J-N, Jan Bolvian, and he was a 19-year-old in, in Rotterdam, Netherlands. And, and at this time, the, the Germans had already come and completely taken over the Netherlands. But Jan was kind of from a, from a kind of a dysfunctional family, and he wasn't getting along with his, with his father, and, and so his father threw him out of the house. He said, you're going to leave the house, or I'm going to give you to the Germans. That's exactly what happened. And so he, he fled the house, but, but then the Germans picked it up, and they conscripted him to forced labor in Germany, which, which happened a lot. In fact, historians tell us that for Polish children and teens, there were 200,000 Polish children and teens who were forced and conscripted into, into labor in Germany during those times times. But this young man writes in his journal, what a night it was. They load into a freight car, and they're on a 75-hour journey from Rotterdam to Bavaria. What a night it was, one you can never forget. Cold wind, disease is cursing. There are 53 of us in our wagon. Last night, one of them just had a nervous breakdown. Several were regularly dashing and hanging out the door because of their diarrhea. Two boys, maybe 16 years old, just cried all through the night beside me. If you've never been afraid before, you will learn to fear here. And I wonder about Joseph. Dry lips, beating heart, anxiety in the bottom of a stomach as, as he heads into Egypt. What would his future be? What, what would it look like as he was embarking on very uncertain times in an uncertain place? And the question would be, how would he show devotion? How would he show fidelity to his God in such a very different place in very strange times? And this matters to us. This matters to us because the same question that we're asking about Joseph is also the same question we need to ask ourselves. When, when we are experiencing uncertain times, we find ourselves unexpectedly in uncertain places. When our world unravels in such a way that we have to scratch our heads and say, God, we, we know that you're good, and yet, how, how do we navigate this part of our lives? How do we live in devotion of fidelity to God when we are in uncertain times and uncertain places? And it affects you. Now, I don't think anybody here has been betrayed by their brothers. I hope not. I don't think anybody here has been sold into slavery, or, or at least I certainly hope not. But there are some of you who have found yourself in those places there are some of you who have been at work and the management changes and all of a sudden your great boss is replaced by a terrible boss and you wonder what in the world is going on here. There are some of you who are living in the community and you thought you would live there all of your life and something changed in your life. You took a job out of state, your spouse took a job out of state and all of a sudden you're in a brand new place. How do you follow God in uncertain times? There are some of you young people, you were happy in your school, your parents picked up, they moved you somewhere else, you're in a different school with different people, what do you do? 
uncertain times and uncertain places. We have a couple of young men in our church here this very morning. In a couple of weeks, they're going to go off to U.S. Army basic training. That is planned. But it's going to be uncertain times. It's going to be uncertain days. How do we follow God in those moments? And I would like to broaden this just a little bit and, and add to the seriousness of this discussion with you because I want to submit something to you. And I don't, I don't go here very often, but, but I think it's really relevant here. I would suggest to you that every single Christian believer who cares about their walk with God, whether you realize it or not, today, this morning, right now, you are living in very uncertain times. We have seen more sociological changes in our culture, and I would recommend to the detriment of some of the dear things that we value the most, more in the last 10 years than maybe we have ever seen in the history of our nation. Christianity has been declined in such a way, so people say, that sociologists and historians are saying that we are no longer in a postmodern world, we are in a post-Christian world. There is an attack on the traditional family and marriage like we have never seen in the history of our culture. My friends, we are living in very uncertain times. And we have found our place in very uncertain places. So how do we live for the Lord like that? How do we follow God like that? And I think these passages, we're going to take a look at a little bit of time that we have left this morning, gives us some hints as to how to do this. Are the, are the solutions, all the solutions here, no. But there are some things here, because if we, as we watch how, how God uses Joseph for his providential plan that we spoke about last week, and we watch how Joseph exercises his love and devotion of fidelity to God, you have to understand that in verse 39, we, we don't see explicit language that, that talks about about how, how Joseph is loving and following God. But we know, for, we know from later chapters and how God assesses their relationship that he is. So let's take some cues from a 17-year-old boy who had to figure out how to navigate a new world and do it for God and see what we can apply from that to our own lives. Maybe you need it now. Maybe you'll need it tomorrow. But sooner or later, you'll need it. Look at verse 1 with me. I'm just going to walk through not all the scriptures. I had to kind of pare down. Let's just walk through a couple of them together if we can. But verse 1, Joseph had been brought down from Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, and the Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had brought him down from there. And we've already established this is a big deal. The father's favorite son, now he is sold off into slavery. How frightening that must have been, but when the chains and the shackles fell off, he found himself in the house of a man named Potiphar. Now it's interesting that the scripture, the inerrant inspired word of God, goes out of its way to tell us three things about Potiphar. Potiphar and I think we should pay attention because those three things tell us some things about the situation and what we should know about who he's with. One of which is he says he's an officer of the Pharaoh. That means he's no small fish in a big pond. This guy's important. This guy has done something, has gained credibility with the Pharaoh, that he is an officer of the Pharaoh. The Bible also says that he is captain of the guard. Now, what that means in this ancient Near East culture is this, that he is over a lot of armed security and a lot of armed military. And on top of that, tradition tells us if you are captain of the guard, it also means that you are chief executioner. Now, who here would like to be a slave of the chief executioner? Yeah. I mean, of all the places that you can land, how would you like to land in that one? Who also, we find out, has his own personal dungeon. Isn't that nice? Yeah, that's the guy I want to work for, right? But it also says, interestingly, it says that he is an Egyptian. And why does the Bible tell us that? I, I, I think I know. Because Potiphar was not a God follower. If he was an Egyptian, he was, he was probably pagan. In fact, based on his name, which means devoted to the son is what it means, his family, his parents, and maybe him were dedicated to a god named Helopolis. That means that's who he was following. So he's a big, big, interesting dude, influential. He's a chief executioner in charge of a lot of the police, so to speak. And he's a pagan. 
He's not a God follower. And this is where Joseph finds himself. And if we were to stop right there, we might say, okay, God, what are you up to? Why would you drop him in this house? But let's go further and see. So in verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. Four times the Bible tells us this. Four times in 23 verses, the Bible goes out of its way to tell us something. The Lord was with Joseph. And he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. This, this is so awesome, right? Despite all the darkness in Joseph's world, despite all the uncertainty that has happened, despite all the, all the terrible things that have unfolded in these last days or, or months or whatever it was, the Bible says that the Lord was with Joseph. And not just in an omnipresent, like God is everywhere way, but in a specific way that God was using Joseph. Do you know what? When God wants to do something, it does not matter where you are at, God is going to do something with you. And we've talked about this before, but let me just say it again because there's maybe one person here who needs to be encouraged by this. Can I just remind you of something, right? When the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph, that's the same Lord that we just sang to. That's the same Lord that we just prayed to. God has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hear me, church. If the Lord was with Joseph and his calamity, the Lord is with you. Do you get that? Just, just let that truth pour on you for just a moment. That, that the Lord is, is with you. But, but watch what happens here. The Bible says that, that he became what? He became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. So working for this pagan, he became a successful man. Things went really well. And I think, I think here is the first key to how do we follow God? How do we honor God? We are in uncertain times and uncertain places and the first clue is right here serve God and honor him where he has placed you serve God and honor him where he has put you See, I think sometimes in our Christian culture, and this may not be you, I'm just kind of making a general, a general observation, but just walk with me for a moment. I think sometimes in Christianity in the West, we assume that to be blessed and to be a blessing to others means that we have a good Christian boss, that we work for a good Christian company, that we work with all Christians we assume that to be a blessing and to be blessed means that my kid is a great Christian history teacher. And I live in a great Christian community with great Christian neighbors. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that was always true? And so there's this mindset that happens sometimes, and I'm not trying to create like a, like a scarecrow to beat up. I just, I just hear this so often over the years. We sometimes, I hope it's not you, but sometimes we have this mindset that says, well, if I don't have a good Christian boss, and if I don't have to work for a good Christian company, and if my child doesn't have a, a, a good Christian history teacher, and I don't have good Christian neighbors, well, I just don't need to be a good Christian. But I think what we see with Joseph is this. You serve and honor God where he has what? Placed you. Because has it occurred to you that maybe God is calling you to be a blessing among unbelieving people? Has it occurred to you that maybe God is calling you to be faithful around people who are not faithful? And there's an energy and a work ethic, and the Holy Spirit walking with you that you bring into places. And when you do that, you start doing what Jesus said you should do, to be salt and to be what? Light. Have you ever had those people that you worked with where, like, when they're there, just everything's better? And when they're not there, you want to clock out early? I, I can remember when I worked with them um, um, in an adolescent psychiatric center, kind of a high-stress environment. I mean, teenagers are bad enough, <laughs> let alone a, a lockdown psychiatric unit. And, but there were two other counselors that I loved it when they were on duty because when they were on duty, everything was great. And where they were not there, I was like watching the clock. Will this shift ever end? Because <laughs> there was something different about them. Let me ask you a question. Do you make your boss successful? 
Do you make your business successful? Students, do you conduct yourself in such a way that your teacher or your professor will look at you and say, man, I don't know, there's just something different about them. Serve and honor God where he has what? Put you. And praise God if it's a wonderful, sanitized place, but let God use you. Y'all follow me? This stuff really matters, and, and that's, that's one of the ways that we, we grow in the Lord. Look at verse 3. His master, I love this. Like, if you like to mark your Bible, there's something here that if you don't pay attention, you're going to miss it, and you're going to miss something good. His master saw that the Lord was with him. Wait a second. That's weird, isn't it? Potiphar, who is a pagan, Egyptian, the Bible says saw the Lord was with him. Well, that should cause us to scratch our head for just a moment. What exactly did Potiphar see? What is it that he noticed? What is it that captured his attention? Now, I, I need to confess to you. I'm, I'm going to submit some things to you. I, I, could, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. <laughs> I'm wrong about a lot of things. But if we look at the scripture from a 30,000 foot view, what did Potiphar see that made him go, there's something different about your life? And I think the first one was, was just diligence. Joseph did his job. Can you imagine that? Joseph showed up. Wouldn't that be nice if everybody did that? But we know that whatever it is that Joseph did in the house, it caused Potiphar to succeed. Whatever responsibilities he had, he must have been carrying them out in a really amazing, beautiful way because it says that the Bible says that he saw that the Lord was with him. There was something about his attitude. There was something about his skill set. There, there was something about how he was doing his work that just caught their attention. Are you that kind of employee? Are you that kind of student where, where you're just diligent and I think the other one was honesty and integrity. See, verse 6, So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. In other words, Potiphar knew that Joseph had so much integrity and so much honesty, this foreign kid from another land, that he didn't have to pay attention to anything. Now, now, think about that. You know, couldn't, couldn't, I mean, just play this out. Couldn't Joseph had said, I'm not the one who chose to be here. I'm not doing anything. Couldn't Joseph had said, I'm going to do just what I have to do until I find a way to escape. Couldn't Joseph had constantly been like whining and saying, it's my brother's fault, it's my brother's fault. They're the ones who sent me here. Let me go, let me go. Maybe he did. The Bible doesn't say that he did. But couldn't if he had done all that? And wouldn't we have agreed with him if he did that? And yet, what does Joseph do? His way of following and honoring God was to demonstrate honesty and integrity. Can, I'm just going to ask a very just candid question. Please don't answer it. To your, answer it to yourself. Are, are you a good employee? Or are you a high-maintenance whiner? Young people, I want to ask you a, just a very candid question. Are you a good student? Are you one of those students with a professor or the teacher is hoping that you are absent that day. <laughs> Be because you see, if we're going to talk about life in post-Christian America, being a jerk is not the pathway to gospel conversations. Because the most un- believing supervisor can see, smell, and recognize integrity and honor. And that's what it is. Now, complete as a side note, pastor's privilege. I want you to know 
that your staff at Providence Church are people of honesty, diligence, and integrity. They are. I am. I am thankful for Jeff, our family care director, and Michelle, our children's director, and Sarah, our Lighthouse Camp co-director, along with Michelle, and Kay, my wonderful personal assistant who keeps me straight, and Julie, who works very much in the shadows as our financial administrator, Steve, our new youth person, uh, Vanessa in the nursery. Not only do they love Jesus, but do you know what? They show up. They do their job. And that's what matters. All right. I just got to finish this up because it's about to get spicy. Okay. Um, all right. Young people, plug your ears. That's a joke. Okay, they're in children's church. So Joseph, um, <laughs> the Bible says, is handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, the master's wife set her eyes on him and said, lie with me. And she starts to proposition Joseph in such a way that she wanted to kind of cheat on her husband. I'm not going to read the whole passage again. I'll leave it to you. But the Bible says, and we know that some years have passed, Joseph is no longer a, a young man, uh, a boy. He, he's become a young adult now who is apparently very, very handsome and, and good-looking. And I can relate. It's a burden. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a bigger challenge than you think it is, you know. Um, um, and, uh, but his, um, Potiphar's wife, she's got a name, has been watching too many episodes of Desperate Housewives because she is uh, on, on the look for a friend that is, that is not her husband. And, and so she propositions him, says, lie with me. Now, if Joseph would have just, if this, only, if this was an isolated incident where Joseph said once and she never asked again, then certainly we, we could, we could um, um, just highlight Joseph and his character and his honesty, but it doesn't stop there. She asked him every single day. What is wrong with this woman? Every single day, the Bible tells us that she keeps talking to him, talking to him. And, and, and then finally what happens, fi finally what happens is that she, she lies about him. She puts the moves on him. He runs, leaves his jacket behind. She calls the husband. The husband says, you're you're in trouble. There, you know, there have been so many messages preached on this part of Genesis 39. And while I think there's some incredible stuff there that we need to know, we could definitely study it. I'm not sure it's the whole thrust of what's happening here, but there's one thing I want to point out to you. As we consider what it means to live for God in uncertain times, let's remember. When God, hear me, church, when God is working through you and around you and with you, temptation is going to show up. And the razor-sharp claws of sin will be eagerly looking to dig themselves into any part of your character that is open and available for compromise. When God is using you, temptation shows up. When God is using you, sin is crouching at the door. And it's good news because Joseph was uncompromising. And that's good news because someday he's going to stand beside the Pharaoh and rule people. And you cannot rule others until you know how to rule yourself. So Joseph finds a spot there. But as verse 19 continues, as soon as his master heard the words of his wife, this is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was in prison. What are the words? Well, she's a conniving, backbiting, dishonest liar. And she tells on her husband, her Joseph, to her husband, who is the chief executioner, remember? And so Potiphar has Joseph thrown in jail. 
And once again, we come to a crossroads, but this is an important crossroads. So as we finish up, I don't want you to miss this because you can look at the scripture right now and I get it, I get it, I'm with you. And you can say, if, if, if God is doing something, then what is going on here? Joseph was doing all of the right things and now this, and you might be looking at your own life going, you know what, I'm trying to do all of the right things and yet life keeps getting more and more difficult. Well, here's the answer because sometimes with obedience to God, there comes a cost. See, we think obedience is always rosy. We think obedience is always clean. We think obedience is always sanitized. We think when we follow God and obey God, everybody's going to step back and go, oh, you're amazing for obeying God. That's so wonderful. Let's give you a gift card. But sometimes obedience is messy. And sometimes obedience is costly. Sometimes obedience is painful in the short run. <laughs> but in the long view, God honors it. And finally, as we, we finish up on a dark note, or not, verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph. It's the fourth time it said that. But this time it adds something. And showed him steadfast love. It's not just the Lord is with him. The Lord showed him steadfast love. Steadfast means it doesn't change. Steadfast means it's not circumstantial. Steadfast doesn't mean sometimes it's great and sometimes it's not. Steadfast means that it keeps going and going and going and going. And the Bible says the Lord, the same Lord we sang to, the same Lord we prayed to, the same Lord that we're following, the Bible says that the character of that Lord is that when we are in the dungeon going, God, I was obeying, I'm not sure what's going on, the Bible says that he has shown his steadfast love. So maybe this morning you're new to the life of church or maybe you've come from a church that doesn't open the Bible very much. So, so for you, these next two minutes are for you. How, how does God show his steadfast love? Look no further than the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the problem is that we are broken sinners. On our best day, we are a hot mess. All of us. And if you don't believe that about your character this morning, you need to talk to God about it, or you need to stop lying. Because we're a hot mess. And the tension of the scripture is this, that the Bible so declares that God loves you. But God is just. And a loving, just God cannot allow sin. Then how does God show his steadfast love in the person of Jesus Christ? Because was it not love that Jesus came and lived a perfect life? Was it not love that Jesus came and died a sinner's death? Was it not love that Jesus came and took the pain and the wrath and the torture that we deserved and took it all upon themselves, the history of all the sins of all history, past, present, and future, that Jesus Christ bore on the cross of Calvary? That is how God demonstrates his steadfast love. The question for you is if you come to a place in your life where you've said, God, I am a broken, hot mess. And Lord, I need your steadfast love. So I'm going to trust the blood of Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins. That I can walk in newness of life and live with the joy of what it means to have the steadfast love of the Lord.